Hey, strangers. Welcome to another episode of The Strange Sessions. I'm Krista. As always, with me is Kurt. Hi, Kurt. Hi. My stomach His just, stomach just my responded. Stu- it didn't even really start until we were just about ready to start recording. So yeah, my stomach... Sounds about yeah. right. Hi, guys. It's on, it's on, on par for the course? Does that... On par no? for the course. I don't know. I'm tired. It's on par for the course. Pa- what does that par, sound right? Par for, oh, that's par for the course. I added an on and it yeah. threw everything it's early. it's early in the morning. Give us a break, people. <laughs> um... So, looking at my notes, if you want to skip over all the chit chat in the beginning, please check the show notes. Hit pause. Check the show notes. Kurt has posted in the notes what time the actual topic starts. So, if you don't want to hear our chit chat, welcoming new strangers on Facebook, and the taste test, you can skip through all of that. We'll so, only be hurt a little bit if you no, want to skip our. Yeah, we'll be really sad. We won't know. No, we won't. To be honest, we won't. Know. Jump right into shout outs. Okay. Only three of them this week, so not hmm. a lot, but. Hmm. I never know how to pronounce this last name. L E I G H. Is it Lay? Lay? Is it Lee? Because I hear it both ways. I would say Lay. So I'm going to say Ricky. I'm going to say Lee. <laughs> I'm going to say Ricky okay. Lee or Lay. Bria Anderson and Bruette Fain. Cool. So thank you guys, Welcome, guys so much for joining the strangers. Yeah. And we really, really appreciate you guys listening. Um, we like look at the, the stats now and we yeah. just, it's so weird to us that I know. we we kind of have listeners in almost every country every country and it's just so weird even if it's just like one listener in some little country somewhere well and the funny so part is we don't we just have these statistics as of when we joined podbean it's not going into the no, past no. so i think there's probably more than we realize and speaking of i sent kurt a screenshot yesterday of our strangers, how many are in Ukraine? Yeah. So we just wanted 20, to like 28, 28, or, yeah, 28 yeah, I believe. Which, hey, that's almost 30 people in the Ukraine who listen to us. And we just wanted, if if you're listening, I don't know how anyone would have the time to listen to this right now or even no. the forethought, but we are thinking of you. Our hearts are breaking for you. We love you. Um, we hope you and your family are Hang safe. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's really scary what's happening over there. It is. And, uh, you know, I had students... So my students are like, I hate Russia. And I'm like, you don't hate, like, the, like I said, Russia's like us where it, it's like 99% just people trying to get by. Right. You know, they just have a psycho for a, exactly. a leader. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, there are a I, lot of good people in Russia. <laughs> yeah, there are. So I just hope this situation all plays out. I hope as it best ends as it can. soon. Yes. I, I don't know how many lives have been lost. I haven't seen a, a count, but I've been seeing photos and just hearing but stories that's and one thing that like me knowing now like what countries our listeners are in it makes me more it aware just, of what's going it, on feel more in, connected. That, in that country yeah, yeah. I, I just feel more connected to what's happening yep. because there are people there who might know who we are i know and that's crazy <laughs> to think about but and, like all these countries that i'm looking at i don't even know where some of these countries are and we have like listeners there i know and it's just bizarre to me the kuwait one still throw, throws yeah, we're me a little bit in kuwait. i have no idea <laughs> why but we strange. are big in kuwait yeah um but hey if we can be the light in the dark for somebody who's going through something awful yeah which anywhere in the world we're told that a lot which yeah. means a lot to us because it does i don't think we started with that intention but it's kind of become what we do is we're like I love when people say that we're like our our paranormal stuff is creepy but we present it in a way that's not like scary. Yeah. You know. So Although two of my coworkers, Kurt and Kayla, who I uh, another um, Kurt? Another Kurt. Cheating See, on me with another Kurt. I refer to you as my Kurt. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and he's Kurt. Thank you. Um but uh, we just had like this team event. I posted the picture of Kayla and I, yep, and our, our signs got posted. Hi, Kayla, and adore, they were both saying that, that they. <laughs> Kurt always tends to listen to the show when it's at night, and he's cleaning his garage, and he's all creeped out. And Kayla, she was listening to the Hazozo episode, like in the dark, driving by herself on the way home from somewhere. <laughs> and I'm like, why do you choose to listen to it at those yep. times? You're gonna get yep. creeped out. Then yeah, you are. You have to listen to it on a sunny Saturday mo- or Sunday morning, and you know, with lots of family and friends. Around. This episode isn't really paranormal. This is more of a conspiracy tinged Ooh, one. I like but it. I do have something weird to say that happened. Okay. Um, if you guys listen to our old episode about our personal experiences, you heard me talking about the stuff in my old apartment in the bathroom where everything was centered in the bathroom. Yeah. Oh. And everything started in February. Uh oh. There. Really? Yeah. So <gasps> last week, one night, I was getting ready to go to bed which for me is like six o'clock. You know, I was getting ready to go to bed, <laughs> but I was in the out. shower. I was showering and all of a sudden I'm like, why is my leg burning? And I look down, oh, no. three scratches down my leg. And you don't work in a factory anymore. No, I don't work in a factory. And so I'm like, I'm, I say that because maybe like metal or something no, yep, could have. Nope. 
And <gasps> it was just like it was in the old apartment. And I'm like, all right, so that's probably a coincidence. <sighs> Next night, before I shower, I usually like shave with my electric razor or whatever. So I'm shaving with my electric razor. All of a sudden, clicks off. So I'm pressing on, 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 nothing. And I'm assuming the battery's dead. Mm-hmm. So I, I try it again, nothing. So I assume battery's dead, put it on the counter, get in the shower. And then like halfway through my shower, I hear a noise <gasps> and I look out and it's on my counter running. Oh my God. Yeah. And that was the day after I got scratched. So it's like. So do you think that in the process of turning it on and off, a battery, so sometimes. The battery was full. So I have no idea what, because I checked. batteries can get slightly dislodged, you know? They can, but and the maybe fact when that you it set happened it down, a day after I got yeah, scratched that is on weird. my leg in the shower. That is So weird. it's like, and it was February, and I'm like, it's February, and this is when stuff happened in my old apartment. So it's almost like, yeah. is it starting to seep now into this new apartment? And that's like a Why super, would it take so long, I don't though? know, because nothing happened. I've, this is like my fourth year there, and nothing mm. has happened at every, any other February or any time. Nothing right. has ever happened there. And this was like the first time something happened, so now it's a little like... That's weird. It is weird. So it's like, did this thing look for me and then finally find me, oh, which God. is a frightening That's thought. That's really scary. But yeah, Keep l- us posted. Yeah, last night was nothing. <laughs> I think the uh, there hasn't been anything since that. And Narnia has a really bad cold, but she hasn't... Narnia has a cold? I feel so bad because when Aww. she gets a cold, her eye runs like oh, crazy. Sure. And then she always has it squinted. <laughs> And then I just hear She's her. She's looking at you all cockeyed. I know. But then when I'm laying in bed and she goes out in the living room, I just hear her sneezing Aww. all the time. <laughs> I feel so bad for her. But she hasn't been like freaked out. So oh, maybe yeah. it's just a coincidence. But I just thought it was really strange. You'd think she would react. Yeah. But... So I just thought it was really weird. That is weird. Um, My COVID cough is starting to slowly get better. Good. You know, thank God. So I'm not up at night coughing anymore. We finally got some snow. <laughs> yeah, all in one week. Yeah, like, it's, it's crazy. I, this is the most snow we've had all season, yeah. which is very un-Wisconsin. Yeah. I feel like we've, we'd have we have been buried under a foot by now, and we yeah. just got like seven, eight inches. Yeah, we got like almost eight ago. inches yesterday in Manitowoc, and I was really thinking I wasn't going to be able to come oh, yeah, down here today. Yesterday. Yeah, yeah. And I was not I was at three o'clock when I left school. I mean, there was a two-hour delay because of the snow when I left school streets were just perfectly yeah. fine we had an ice storm earlier this week that was horrible <laughs> that was crazy like i was literally afraid to even bring a garbage bag out to the dumpster because yeah. it was like sheer was ice outside ice. my apartment i worked from home that day yeah that was nuts yeah. yeah we've had an interesting week we have it's been a crazy week just in general any other housekeeping you can think of i don't think so just to thank you as always to our coffee or ko-fi however you want to pronounce it subscribers it's funny so jim and i watched this guy on youtube it's a cooking channel brian um lagerstrom and he has coffee but he pronounces it kofi <laughs> so i'm like i have no idea how to pronounce this yeah, at least with patreon you know how to pronounce it with coffee yeah. ko-fi kofi i don't know yeah we don't know but thank you guys but so just much. thank you yeah, thank you for you get to hear our little pre-show banter when her and I are talking. My my pathetic innuendo, whatever I said before, I don't see even remember. See our video taste test. You can see our video taste test. You get the side sessions. Depending on what level you are at. Depending on what level you are at. And just a reminder, if anybody's out there and you're still just like a normal monthly subscriber, you're missing out on stuff. We're, we're not really posting anything to like the... P- we, we're posting everything to the three levels. It's yep. the same exact price. So if you're paying five dollars and you're not in one of the membership levels cancel your normal monthly membership and join the first tier yeah because you'll get the simply extra strange stuff. the only yeah. thing that the first tier doesn't get is the le- the second uh monthly side sessions right i don't think they even get the first no so the first tier gets um the unedited version yeah. of the weekly episode and they get the video taste oh, I test. Oh, I thought the first tier got the... Second oh, okay. tier. Okay. The second tier gets one side session. The third tier gets both side sessions and everything below it. Okay. So if you're just paying $5 a month to support us, why don't you switch to the first tier membership for the same price and you'll get an unedited episode a day yeah. early and you'll get the video taste test. So I, I can't stress that enough. You're, you're going to get more bang for the your buck. The unedited episode, you're, you're paying to hear me stumble over <laughs> words left and right. and <laughs> So hopefully that's okay. I, I think sometimes that's fun to listen to, it is. actually. It us is. screwing up. <laughs> do we have anything else? No, should we get this taste test Let's going? Let's get this taste test going. Um, I'm going to pour the tea first, and then we'll turn okay. the camera on for the actual okay. taste test. Which tea is this? Uh, um, from this the is cryptid the Vegetable teas? Man. Vegetable Man. Yeah. This has been steeping for a little while. He sounds like a while. healthy cryptid, at least. He does. He's very nutritious. That looks so much like pee in a glass. It does look like pee in a glass. Okay, I'm going to move the uh, microphone away so I can do this. Ooh, spooky. Okay, ready? Oh, oh, oh on your notes. 
<laughs> Thank you. I brought I brought napkins down and I still managed to get <laughs> this thing. <laughs> I still managed to get it all over my notes. Ooh, it oh. smells good. It smells minty. It does smell minty. Should we take a sip? Let's take a sip. It's gonna be hot. Mm. Oh, that's good. It is that's good. Again, very mild. I'm it's not picking up on anything specific. I'm picking up mint. I'm picking up on yeah. mint, but there's a little something else, but I can't figure out what it is. Of course I got, geez, I got tea on my glasses. I like this one. I'm killing it today. There's something else in there. I want to say it almost tastes a little lavender-y. I think I saw lavender when I was actually... I taste I taste mint and it like something like lavender. Raspberry green tea. Weird. I'm not picking up on the raspberry at all. No. Okay, so where does it say what's actually in here? I pick up 100% on on mint and lavender. Yeah, so it doesn't say like what all is in here. Yeah. But it's just raspberry. I can tell you it's raspberry green tea. Wow. I actually I think green tea is often really strong. Yeah. Like too strong, and I think this is really mild. I like it. I do I really, yeah, I get something minty. I really like this one. I don't pick up on the raspberry, though. No, I pick up on mint and lavender, but I really like this one. I like it too. Should I grab something from our Norway box? Yeah, let me get the camera going. Okay. Oh, okay, it's recording. It is flashing. Hi. Hi. Oh, yeah. Hi. <laughs> it's so weird being backwards. It is weird. Okay. okay. Our first one from Norway, I believe it's a hobby bar. Hobby bar. Okay. Oh, I hope it's chocolate. Oh, it's like, hmm, we'll see. It's hard to tell. Here, I, I don't think it has hazelnuts. I hope not. I'm still not clear on the, the we'll labeling We'll be able to tell all, like when we tear it in half or whatever. Okay. I want to get the tape off so I and can And I brought the second taste test from home because it's something that w people have posted on our Facebook and it's something we had to try. Ooh, okay. Cool. People posted it on our Facebook? Yeah. Should I be scared? No. <laughs> that, <didn't laughs> that wasn't a real con that wasn't a convincing no, was it? No, it was not. Okay, got a picture of this. Should I open it? Yeah. Oh, here, let me hold it up to the camera. Hobby bar. Oh, it's chocolate. <sighs> it looks good. It does. Tear that bad boy. It looks. But how do it, we know? It almost looks like it. I don't know, but it almost looks like a Ooh, Charleston chew. Ooh. It looks like marshmallow. It's marshmallow -y. You can have the. You, you no, can take no, the bigger I'm one. I'm good. I'm good. You sure? Yep. I'm gonna take a picture of this. Sniff test? Yeah, it totally smells like a, a marshmallowy Charleston chew. This is going to be good. I think so, too. And I'm not even a marshmallow fan. I don't know if you can see that. Okay, ready? Yep. Oh, wow. Was not expecting that layer of crunchiness. No, there's like a crunchy wafer layer on top. This is really good. What is the flavor? It's got like a flavor to it. It's not coconut, is it? What is that? <laughs> I can't place it. Like graham cracker. Kind of. There's something in this marshmallowy layer. I really like this. Mm. I just can't place what that is. Wow. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's not hazelnuts. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> All of a sudden I can't talk. Mm, I'm it's not, delicious. I just can't play. I'm not a marshmallow guy, but I think I would place this in our top three things that I've ever had for a taste test. I love this. Not that I'm going to be able to read any of this. I love the that there's a crunchy layer. Mm -hmm. I was not expecting the... It's like a... Um, oh, yeah. I can definitely read these. Uh, I feel like it's it's like a graham cracker or like a... But there is a taste. There's like something... Not pi it's like fruity, not not pineapple, not what am I trying to say? Not I have no idea. Banana. Mm -hmm. It's banana. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can't believe it took me that long to identify no, once banana. You said it, once you said it, I was like, that is banana. <laughs> wow. Oh, what a, a surprising combination. But bananas and chocolate are really good. I love this. I love the the, the texture of this. Yeah. Yeah. I me love too. that there's a crunchy layer. That's one thing I often don't like about marshmallowy stuff is there's no crunch, and this has a little crunch in it. I like definitely it. a ten out of ten. This is one of my favorite things that I've ever tried. It's it really delicious. is. It's amazing. 
I'm going to give it a 9 out of 10. Why? I, I don't know. <laughs> okay. I don't I don't know. The banana is delicious, but it also throws me just a tiny bit. Oh, my God. I love that. Like, literally love that. Uh, sip our tea again. This is part of our tea. Norway listeners, if you, have, if you never want to send us hobby bars, I'll take them. And from that, we go to this. Is it pickle flavored? I'm actually really trying to acclimate my palate to pickly stuff. Oh, I'm excited the about that. The tangy pickle Doritos that people have posted. Why is it flashing yet? I don't know. That's weird. Yeah. It's recording. Maybe it's going to die. I don't know. We'll but our out. listeners posted this in the group a while ago, and I finally saw the tangy, a small bag of the tangy pickle Doritos. I'm, 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 yeah, but I don't know. Eating what, more pickle How did we get tagged foods? as being pickle centric? I think we had one pickle taste test. Well, we had a couple pickle taste tests. And we I had, was like, like the pickle slushies that you put in yeah. the freezer from Canada. And I think because I don't really like pickles, we made a big deal out of it. Yeah. I pickle stuff can either be really good yeah. or really horrendous. I agree. And pickle tangy pickle Doritos. Can I'm I take guessing, a picture of the bag? I'm guessing good because Doritos yeah. generally doesn't f things up. No, they're usually. Wait, let me zoom. The bag is okay. I'm so I want to do a lot of preserving in our garden this year from our garden. So I'm acclimating myself to pickled flavors and <laughs> getting used to it and fermented foods. Have you had Jardinera? If not, uh, you need I think to. I have, it's amazing. I, think I have one of their albums. <laughs> I have no idea what that is. It's a bunch of. It's like pickled. It's Italian pickled vegetables, and it can be spicy. Oh or yes, mild. I've seen it. I've seen it. It's I've never in had oil. it. Oil. Yeah, I've never had it. We just bought some last weekend, and I don't know how we've lived without it this long. It is. It's amazing. The we one put thing it on I could everything. not acclimate myself to is cilantro. I dislike oh, I cilantro. cilantro. Oh, I cannot. Like people either love yeah, it or hate it. I hate it. I think it's amazing. People think it tastes like soap. Jim hated it too, but I've made him eat it so much that he likes it now. It doesn't smell like Doritos. It doesn't smell as... Maybe a little dilly. It's a little dilly, but it's not as strong as I expected them to do. I'm taking a picture of a Dorito like nobody's ever seen a Dorito before. (laughs) This is what a Dorito looks like. They don't smell overpoweringly dilly. Dilly dilly. I'm just going to keep saying it. Dilly dilly. Okay, ready? I'm curious. Yeah, right. Let's do it. Oh. Oh. It really hits the tip of your tongue. <laughs> but once you get past that. It's good. It's good. It has a really subtle dill flavor. That's what it is. But that first initial bite is uh, like, whoa. That's where the tangy comes in from the tangy. Oh, my God. Yeah, now it's the just. The tip kick- of your now tongue it, yeah, is but like. Now it's kicking me. Now it's like the aftertaste is getting to me. Well, and you know how you'll get a Dorito that's like saturated. I wouldn't want a Dorito saturated in this flavor. That first initial bite, I don't know. But once you chew past that. <laughs> yeah, but it's that first initial bite I have a hard time with because I don't want to have to do this every time I eat a pickle. I mean, every time I eat a Dorito. It's entertaining to watch, though. <laughs> I'm glad it's As they can attest to. Oh, my God. So gilly. But it's really addicting. Like, I just want to keep eating them. Dilly dilly. I'm Jim gonna, will probably really like yeah, these. Yeah, I'm going to give those a seven. They're not the worst thing I've ever had, but I, I have. A, I can't get past that first initial. It's right at the tip of your tongue. Yeah, because it, it, it slaps you in the face <laughs> when you have that yep. first bite. It's very delish. Not bad, um, though, but this. Hobby bar. I'll give it. I'll also give it a seven. Okay. All right. We should have started with the pickle one and then went to the chocolate one. Yeah, and on a high note. Yep. We have goodbye to our sidesters. Bye, sidesters. Now I got that flavor in my mouth. Good I thing know. we have this delicious tea to watch it down. Watch it. We're going to watch it down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. We got a uh, message from Logan. Oh, we, Logan. We love Lo- Logan. I we love, love Logan. you. Uh, she said she heard us talking about coming to Los Angeles and being afraid of it. And she says, do not be afraid. And she wants us to come there because she wants to meet us. That would be I awesome. told her, I said, we ever get that way, you know. Oh, yeah. We're hooking up with you. Heck yeah. But Los Angeles is just. She's a long time, long time yeah. listener. And she's awesome. She's and amazing. I always see her letter behind you. <laughs> yes. With her, almost looks like a typewriter typed it because her handwriting oh, is so, so perfect. Good. 
All right. What's the time? What are we looking at? How's a titillating 20 looking? I just burped up banana and dill. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to say it was not pleasant. It's charming. Um, 28, but keep in mind that's with okay. unedited stuff at the beginning. Okay. We're going to dive into today's main story. Do we have anything else? Or I don't think so. Head into the main Probably. story. Head into the main story. Let's do it. We have some more tea. I want to remember to throw that out so we don't get ants. All right. Warning people ahead of time that this is a beefy episode. Beefy. So uh, you might want a flow chart for some of this stuff. You might want Is your... it like a, a roast? Like a rump roast? Beefy? <laughs> yeah, it's like a rump roast. Or like roast. a really juicy cheeseburger? Um, is it juicy? No, I'm going to go with a rump roast. Okay. It's like a rump roast. It has to slow cook for several it's a, hours. It's a slow cook, and there's a lot of meat. I mean, there is a lot of meat here, and sometimes right. rump roasts are tied. Yeah. So you're gonna have like the conspiracy Ooh, strings going from this to this to this because I talk about a lot of different. A lot of things. supporting vegetables. Oh, there are a lot of supporting vegetables in this thing. Holy That's a great cow! Great analogy. But uh, so just be warned. This is a beefy episode. Try to stay with me. Almost anything that I talk about on here is a rabbit hole of its own. Okay. So just settle in, grab a beer in a hot pocket, I guess, and just <laughs> s- settle in. It and has are... to specifically be a beer in a hot pocket. It has to be a beer in a hot pocket. So we are going to start with a man named Danny Casalero. Danny Casalero was born June 16th, 1947, into a Catholic family in McLean, Virginia. I think it's McLean. McLean? How's it spelled? M C L E A N. McLean, probably. McLean, I think. McLean, Virginia. The son of an obstetrician and the second of six children. Casalero, by all accounts, was a good kid and a good student. He graduated from Providence College in Rhode Island in 1968, and he met and married Terry Pace, a former Miss Virginia. Dang, good for him. The couple had a son named Trey and divorced after 10 years with Casalero granted legal custody of his son. Casalero was kind of a jack-of-all-trades, having a ton of varied interests. These included amateur boxing, writing poems and short stories, and raising purebred Arabian horses. Oh, <laughs> it's a okay. Varied, that it's is an expensive a, hobby. Uh, yeah. So boxing, writing poems and short stories, and raising horses. Did your Bob Ross mug change at all? No. No, oh, just yep. a bummer. Sorry, go on. Okay. He also dabbled in journalism, specifically investigative journalism, writing about such issues as the Soviet naval presence in Cuba, the Castro Intelligence Network, and Chinese communist smuggling of opium into the United States. Okay. Dang. Towards the end of the 1970s, He's he got a kind lot of, of hobbies. Yeah, he does. Uh, Jack of all trades. Yeah. Towards the end of the 1970s, he kind of gave up on journalism and became interested in the growing computer industry, acquiring a series of computer industry trade publications, which he began selling towards the end of the 1980s. In early 1990, he decided to take up journalism again, and soon after that, he took an interest in a case that his IT contacts had made him aware of called the Inslaw case. And I'm assuming that's about, what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk a lot about the Inslaw okay. case. So he got into computers and stuff, and the IT people he was working with said, you're an investigative journalist. You should look into this Inslaw stuff. And he had no idea what they're talking about. As neither do I. So we're going to come back to Danny later, but now we need to talk about Inslaw. So stay with me here because this gets funky. Okay. Literary journalist Ron Rosenbaum once wrote that the Inslaw story alone is enough to drive a sane man to madness. Inslaw began as a nonprofit organization called the Institute for Law and Social Research. The Institute was founded in 1973 by a man named William Hamilton to develop case management software for law enforcement office automation. This is one of those things where you have to forget the times we live in and put yourself in those pre-internet days. Sure. And that's hard to do sometimes. You know, say that the police arrest some dude in Montana. At the time, there was really no immediate way of knowing if this guy was wanted in other states, if he had prior re- arrests. Right. You know, they didn't know what his records were. The only way to do that was to call around to other precincts and have those people hoof it down to their filing cabinets in the basement to look for information. That's crazy to think about, I know, actually. but that's how it was. <laughs> this know. took forever, and it was a wow. huge pain in the butt. There could be mistakes made, stuff could get overlooked, or people just might not want to share the information they had with other precincts if there was like some kind of rivalry between the precincts. Mm -hmm. Well, at this time, computers had just started coming into play, and the move was being made to start storing records on a computer rather than some filing cabinet in a dusty basement somewhere. 
Funded by grants and contracts from the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration, or the LEAA, Bill Hamilton and his wife Nancy and the other people working at the Inslaw Institute developed a program it called Promise. You're going to hear a lot about Promise today. Okay. Promise is P-R-O-M-I-S. It's an acronym for Prosecutors Management Information System. And it was to be used in law enforcement record keeping and case monitoring activities. So this computer program, Promise, was designed to organize the paperwork generated by law enforcement and the courts. And I couldn't really get a grasp on whether it was the first version of Promise or the enhanced version that we're going to talk about. But it had the ability for the first time ever for computers to communicate with each other. Okay. And that was a huge thing. So because, like from one person. Yeah, like to there was another. really no internet at the time. Yeah. But if you had promise and you know, like say us here, we have promise in Manitowoc and say she, well, Sheboygan, say Sheboygan has promise. Mm -hmm. We are hooked up and we can, you know, like combine our How do you do that without the internet though? I think it was still dial up. Oh. I think it was dial up. Okay. But more or less, it was people storing, like law enforcement people storing their records on a computer for the first time to be mm -hmm. able to keep track of everything and being able to correlate what another person had. Like, like Manitowoc could maybe look at Sheboygan's arrest list to see, you know, if this guy has ever been arrested here. Or, this, so this or was for the, the first, same thing. Yeah. Or so this was okay. like the first time that this became a thing where we were able to do that. And it's, it sounds weird now, but when there was no internet, like this was a huge, huge thing. In 1979, the Department of Justice contracted with the Institute to do a pilot project that installed versions of Promise in four U.S. attorneys' offices, two using the mini computer version and the other two using a special word processor version, which the Institute was developing. When Congress voted to abolish the LEAA in 1980, Hamilton decided to continue operating as a for-profit corporation now instead of a, a non-profit. Non yep. okay. <clears throat> in, ja <clears throat> in January 1981, Hamilton established the for-profit Inslaw, transferring the Institute's assets over to the new corporation. The Department of Justice was said to be looking at flat-out buying promise for a huge sum of money, which, as you can imagine, had the people at Inslaw popping the cork on their champagne bottles. Right. You know, they created this program that they can use to... It's it's basically a... What do I want to say? Database. It's a mm -hmm. database. Yeah. They basically have this program that law enforcement people, the courts, can use as a database. And the Department of Justice says, heck yeah, we're going to buy that from you for millions of dollars. <laughs> Well, then all sorts of issues with the contract started. It's too much to go into here, but just as Inslaw had started working on the updated version of Promise called either Promise 82 or Enhanced Promise that it was going to sell on the market, the Department of Justice started backing out of several sections of the contracts, and ultimately Inslaw had to declare bankruptcy because they weren't getting the money from the Department of Justice. And in the end, due to some shady contract and law wrangling, the Department of Justice ended up with Enhanced Promise for free. So basically, the Department of Justice screwed over Inslaw and ended up with the version of Enhanced uh. Promise without having to pay for it. Mm. Yep. That sounds about right. There were more legal shenanigans and stuff, and in a 1987 hearing, Judge George Basin ruled that, quote, the Department of Justice took, converted, and stole Inslaw's Enhanced Promise by trickery, fraud, and deceit. Trickery. So when you, have a, when, you have a just, uh, when you have a judge saying that, you know, yeah, uh, DOJ was doing some... Shady BS. Mm -hmm. And the judge concluded that the Department of Justice had used a threat of terminating advance payments to get a copy of the enhanced promise version that it was not entitled to, and that it had negotiated part of its contract in bad faith, never intending to meet its commitment. This ruling, though, was later overturned in 1991 by another judge hmm. who was friendly with the mm. DOJ. Okay. Yeah. Basically, what you got is this company getting screwed. Yeah. Royally. Right. And getting this insanely useful program stolen from then by the Department of Justice. Sure. From a January 18th, 2022 article on consortiumnews.com called, quote, Prism's Controversial Forerunner, the article says, quote, Promise was designed to track the vast amount of criminal cases piling up in the Department of Justice offices around the country. Bill Hamilton, in an interview for this story, recounted, quote, 
It was always a tracking program. It was designed to keep track of cases in local U.S. attorney's offices, which means street crimes, keep track of the scheduled events in court, whatever actually takes place, who's there, witnesses, police officers, conclusions, convictions, acquittals, and whatever. So originally, Inslaw was awarded $9.6 million to install the program in 20 U.S. attorney's offices with further installations in the remaining 74 offices if successful. This would be the last government contract the Hamiltons would receive, not because the system failed, but to the contrary, because it was too successful. Mm -hmm. Hamilton explained, quote, quote, we developed it originally just for prosecutors, but some of our users wanted to have it shared with the courts and the police. So because of that, the software was engineered to make it adaptable. In making it highly adaptable, a byproduct was to make it usable for non-prosecutor tracking that made it adaptable to track anything totally outside the criminal justice system. So basically now anybody, you know, they're not using it anymore just for criminal, for like the the legal stuff. Mm-hmm. Now people realize they can use it as a database for anything. anything. Yep. Yeah. It became obvious with the latest round of modifications, any data system could be integrated into Promise. And those data systems could interact, that is, combine with each other, forming a massive tracking database of people via government documents such as birth and death certificates, licenses, mortgages, lawsuits, or anything else kept in a database. Promise could also track banking transactions, arm shipments, communications, airplane parts, anything. That's so disturbing. Actually. Yeah, so basically they, like, Inslaw made this, like, with a good goal in mind like to yeah. help help prosecutors and all this stuff sure. and police departments and all of a sudden the department of justice is like hey you know you could use this database to track anything right and, hello big brother yeah and we're gonna get even more into that okay with the discovery of these new capabilities inslaw's problems began Unknowingly, the Hamiltons had embarked on an odyssey winding from the White House and the heart of the Reagan inner circle, bankruptcy court, a congressional investigation, secret informants, the CIA, NSA, and Israeli intelligence Mossad. According to a January 1st, 1993 article in Wired magazine called, quote, The Inslaw Octopus, the article says, quote, By late November 1992, the nation had turned its attention from the election-weary capital to Little Rock, Arkansas, where a new generation of leaders conferred about the future. But in a small Washington, D.C. office, Bill Hamilton, president and founder of Inslaw Incorporated, and Dean Merrill, a former Inslaw vice president, were still very much concerned about the past. The two men studied six photographs laid out on the table before them. Have you ever seen any of these men, Merrill was asked? Immediately, he singled out the second photo. In a separate lineup, Hamilton's secretary also singled out the same photo. Both said that the man had visited Inslaw in February 1983 for a presentation of Promise, Inslaw's bread-and-butter legal software. Hamilton, who knew the purpose of the lineup, identified the visitor as Dr. Benjamin Orr. At the time of his visit, Orr claimed to be a public prosecutor from Israel. Orr was impressed with the power of Promise, which had recently been updated by Inslaw to run on a powerful 32-bit VAX computer from Digital Equipment Corporation. He fell in love with the VAX version, Hamilton recalled. Dr. Orr never came back, and he never bought anything. No one knew why at the time. But for Hamilton, who has fought the Department of Justice for almost 10 years in an effort to salvage his business, once his co-workers recognized the man in the second photo, it all made sense. The second photo was not of the mysterious, non-existent Dr. Orr, but it was instead Raphael Etienne, chief of the Israeli Defense Force's Anti-Terrorism Intelligence Unit. The Department of Justice sent him over for a look at the property they were about to misappropriate or steal, Mm. and Etienne liked what he saw. Department of Justice documents record that one Dr. Benjamin Orr left the Department of Justice on May 6, 1983, with a computer tape containing promise tucked under one arm. So now the Department of Justice has promise, and Mossad, the Israeli Secret Service, has promise. This brings us to a man named Michael... I can't... This name is... Oh, my God. This brings us to a man named Michael Rakanoshudo. <laughs> I'm just going to call him Michael R. I'm going to call him Michael R. Yeah. I would too. Uh, This comes from a website called Victim of the State. Michael R. enters the intrigue now. R. is a fascinating guy. According to a book that came out about Danny Casolaro, the author says, 
Michael R. was a gifted child. When he was just 10 years old, he wired his parents' neighborhood with a working private telephone system that undercut Ma Bell. Jeez. In the eighth grade, he won a science fair with a model for a three-dimensional sonar system. When he was 10, he started yeah, this yep. stuff? By okay. the time he was a teenager, he had won so many science fairs with exhibits of laser technology that he was invited to be a summer research assistant at Stanford University. Dr. Arthur Shallow, a Nobel laureate, remembers him saying, quote, you don't forget a 16-year-old youngster who shows up with his own argon laser. So Michael R., who also is a self-proclaimed CIA operative, was a project manager for the Wackenhut Company, a security company that is virtually a CIA front. After Earl Bryan of Hadron Incorporated illegally obtained the legal rights to promise from Inslaw, the software company the Hamiltons had originally owned... He hired Michael R. to create a back door into the software. This would enable the CIA and Mossad to spy on any other intelligence agency that was using Promise. By using this back door, they could go in and see what they were doing on their computer. Hmm. And Michael R. is said to have been the person that modified the Promise software, working at the Cabazan or Cabazon Indian Reservation near Indio, California, which is also a hotbed of CIA intrigue and black ops projects. Previously and supposedly, Michael R. had participated in developing software enabling the CIA to launder drug money raised by trafficking drugs through an airport in Mena, Arkansas, while Clinton was governor of the state and Bush Sr. was in the White House. In a signed affidavit to the federal court, Michael R. stated that, quote, The Wackenhut Kabazan Kabazan joint venture was intended to support the needs of a number of foreign governments and forces, including governments and forces in Central America and the Middle East. The Contras in Nicaragua represented one of the most important priorities of the joint venture. Eight days after providing Inslaw with the affidavit in support of their lawsuit against the U.S. Department of Justice, Michael R. was arrested for conspiracy to manufacture methamphetamines. Hmm. Okay. So he was going to help. He was like filing an affidavit to, to help Inslaw you know, prove that this was stolen from them and what they were doing with it. And shortly after that, he was arrested for distributing meth. Uh, yeah. Michael insisted Do you that think th that was real? I don't know. Michael, he's a... Maybe Michael, he was framed Michael or Michael or is a fascinating guy, but I don't know. We'll, we'll get more into him. Okay. But he insisted that the factory on his property was for refining precious metals and not making meth, but the plea fell on deaf ears. So basically, so far, they make this legal software. Department of Justice screws them out of it. Department mm -hmm. of Justice gives it to Mossad, the uh, Israeli intelligence. And they have this Michael R. put a backdoor in there so that whoever has this software, we are able to sneak in and see what is in their databases. Okay. Which none of that surprises me. I think your little recaps are good because this is a <laughs> lot. <laughs> like I said, this is a, this is a, this is a tough one. It's meaty. Yeah. And But it said that Michael worked on it. I think it's Cabazan or Cabaz. I think it's Cabazan Indian Reservation. But that's where he said to have put the back door into the software. But eight days after he uh, provided Inslaw with the affidavit about what was going on, he was arrested for meth. And the article goes on to say... To me, that just seems very coincidental don't you yeah it, there's a lot of coincidence the there's a, there's is a, a lot of strange. you're gonna see that coming up here there's a lot of coincidental okay. timing going back to the article it says understanding the octopus is like the old story of the blind men trying to comprehend their first encounter with an elephant the parts you touch can appear to be completely different and totally unrelated just running over the outlines of the case in this little time we didn't even mention mainstream media reports published prior to 9 11 that infamous FBI spy Robert Hansen sold an upgraded version of Promise to Russia, who in turn sold it to Osama bin Laden. It's believed that Al-Qaeda used the software to penetrate databases and then move funds between banks without being detected by U.S. counterterrorism groups, and that the software was instrumental in the September 11th attack on the World Trade Center. Mm. So like an octopus, the tentacles extending from the modifications made by Michael R. at the Cabazon Reservation are many and far-reaching. Wow. So we'll come back to Michael R. So that article mentions Earl Bryan of Hadron Incorporated, and he's got nothing to do with the Hadron Collider. I <laughs> that was like the first thing that I, I like, looked. Wait, what? <laughs> that was the first thing that I looked into. Okay. So that article mentions Earl Bryan of Hadron Incorporated, who supposedly hired Michael R. to put a backdoor into the Promise program. Earl Bryan was a close friend of Edwin Meese, who was the Attorney General of the United States for seven years during the Reagan administration. 
That brings us to the October surprise conspiracy theory. Do you have you ever heard of that one? Nope. It's fa- it's really fascinating. October uh, surprise. Yeah, that's a that's a rabbit hole that we could even maybe do an episode about at some point. The October surprise theory claims that when 66 hostages from the United States were being held by Iran in 1979 and 1980 during Jimmy Carter's presidency, a backdoor deal was made by Ronald Reagan and his staff with the Iranians to not release the hostages until after the election because they worried that an early release of the hostages would cause a surge in votes for Jimmy Carter, preventing Reagan from winning the election. And that's a huge conspiracy theory. Hmm. And I, I don't really, I've never really looked much into it, but it's just seems so coincidental that sure. right after Reagan, like I think it was literally like 20 minutes after Reagan was announced as the president, Iran let the hostages go. Mm, yeah. So basically the October surprise theory says that Reagan and his cronies called, you know, Iran and like, you know, keep them for until after the election. Oh, okay. Because it makes perfect sense. If they came, if they were freed like two weeks before the election, Carter might have won because people would have been... It was under his administration. It was under his administration. Yeah. So that's the October surprise theory. <laughs> it's rumored that as part of the deal with the Iranians to keep the hostages until after the election, Mies offered the Iranians a copy of Promise. So Promise is getting around. <laughs> it's a real floozy. Yeah, it is a real a floozy. So yeah, so now Iran has apparently a copy of Promise because it was part of the October surprise package, I guess. So now we get to Robert Maxwell. According to a June 7th, 2019 article on the Expose the Enemy website called Robert Maxwell, Promise Gate, and the Advent of the Israeli Cybersecurity Industry. Promise Gate. Yeah, Promise Gate. <laughs> the article says, quote, a key player in Soviet Israeli espionage for decades to come was Robert Maxwell, real name Jan Ludwig Hock. Maxwell began his career as an interrogation officer for the British Army at the Bad Salzufen headquarters in the British-occupied zone of Germany right after World War II, where he was interrogating German scientists. Maxwell would spend a considerable amount of time in the Russian sector of occupied Germany, which made British and American intelligence question his loyalty. According to the book KGB, Death and Rebirth, by author Martin Eben, Robert Maxwell's biographer Tom Bauer says that he was told by Detlov Raymond, an employee of Maxwell in New York, that Maxwell's relations with the Russians and the KGB were not just simply social. Raymond asserted that, either willingly or unwillingly, Maxwell compromised himself with the Russians. He cited a KGB claim that Maxwell signed a document which promised to assist the secretary, er, which promised to assist the security agency if needed. Maxwell used his contacts from authorities in the Allied occupation of Germany to become the managing director of the U.S. and British distributor for Springer Verlag, a German publisher of scientific journals, which was taken over by the Allies. Springer Verlag then merged with the British Butterworth Publishing Company to form the Butterworth Springer Publishing Company. No relation to Mrs.? No, no, no syrup. <laughs> Maxwell then bought three-fourths of Butterworth Springer, then changed the company's name to Pergamon Press. Probably because it kept getting confused with the syrup. Probably. So Pergamon <laughs> Press is a lot better. Yeah. So then after that fake doctor that came in and and got the copy of Promise, got his hands on Promise, he worked through a former Mossad agent. And Mossad is one of those... Mossad, I, I've mentioned on in other episodes, is the Israeli version of the CIA. Mm-hmm. And those are legit one of the few things that I freak out about researching because they are badasses yeah 100 percent. sure like you don't mess with them like i said they make the cia look like boy scouts yeah so Mossad, i imagine just yeah the... so Mossad is bad um not bad not, not no if you're no, listening no, no. to this Mossad, i don't mean bad i don't mean i mean you're bad like <laughs> yeah you like, know like ugh. like michael jackson bad <laughs> yes exactly i guess i was thinking mr t bad but sure okay bad is good yeah so after Etienne got his hands on promise, he worked through a former Mossad agent who reached out to a Silicon Valley computer engineer to construct another backdoor into promise, this time just for the Israelis. This gave Israel their own backdoor into the intelligence agencies of other countries that bought promise from Israel. Israel knew that it wouldn't be able to sell promise openly, so they recruited a third party seller. Etienne knew the perfect man for the job. The man was Robert Maxwell. Maxwell used his Pergamon Press technology network to buy up Israeli technology firms, which were fronts for the Mossad. In the United States, Maxwell had also set up a raft of small front companies that were a spinoff of his own gigantic Pergamon Press in Britain. A number of those companies were based in Virginia and Arkansas. 
among board members were several former members of intelligence agencies. So I think he has all these front, busy. he has all these front companies that are basically just oh yeah, we're just a publishing company mm-hmm. and half the people working there are intelligence. Interesting. Yeah. Just scary that people yeah. can do this undetected. So, so through Maxwell's company, Promise was sold to the intelligence agencies of New Zealand, Australia, Thailand, Turkey, Belgium, Poland, East Germany, Egypt, Bulgaria, Nicaragua, Colombia, Guatemala, South Africa, Zimbabwe, China, and finally the Royal Canadian Mounted Police in the KGB. So now everybody's got Promise. Sure. And <laughs> most of them... Israel, the, it's very positive. Uh, Mossad, Everybody's got promise. Yeah, Mossad can go into everybody's, yeah, every wow. country's intelligence agency and see what's going on. It's like a virus that's yeah. spreading. Yeah, it's, it basically is. Yeah, so the Israelis also sold promise to the Eastern Bloc, Nicaragua, Colombia, Chile, Brazil, and the Rothschild controlled Credit Suisse Bank through Maxwell's Israelis front company, DGEM. The sales to Credit Suisse would give Israel the ability to monitor every transaction going through Credit Suisse, giving them an unwarranted advantage over the world financial market. Promise was also sold to the infamously corrupt and now defunct BCCI, or the Bank of Credit and Commerce International, which is a rabbit hole of its own, because the BCCI was, was like, bad. It was like a, a la- money laundering. Sure. It was like It was like... I never really heard of the BCCI no, before I can just imagine this, though. but that's a rabbit hole on its own. BCCI was a Mossad slash CIA affiliated bank that was involved in numerous scandals of the 1980s, most infamously including financing the Reagan administration's Iran-Contra secret arms deal and serving as a CIA drug trafficking and money laundering conduit for Pakistani state-sponsored terrorists and the Afghan Mujahideen, the predecessors to Al-Qaeda. Hmm. According to Robin Cook, former Foreign Secretary of the United Kingdom from 1997 to 2001, Al-Qaeda literally means the database and was originally the computer file of thousands of Muhaddin who were recruited and trained with help from the CIA and Mossad to defeat the Russians. Inexplicably, and with disastrous consequences, it never appears to have occurred to Washington that once Russia was out of the way, bin Laden's organization would turn its attention to the West. Maxwell's most infamous and damaging promise affair was his business venture with China and the CSIS, which is China's secret service. The Chinese could only dream of obtaining U.S. nuclear secrets and other secret technology from the Los Alamos National Laboratories. What about Los Alamos, one of his hosts was later reported to have mused. Was even Los Alamos no longer impenetrable? Maxwell just reportedly laughed and said that even Los Alamos's defenses, like the walls of Jericho, would tumble under the electronic power of enhanced promise. Thus, Maxwell gave China access to Israel's secret backdoor. So now China has access to That's the backdoor that Israel was using to get into everybody else's version of promise. Mm. Yeah, so it's wow. things, yeah, things aren't going good. So then Maxwell gave China access to Israel's secret backdoor. Mossad was pissed at Maxwell for revealing their backdoor, but Etienne used the development to his advantage. Quote, he planned to penetrate deep into the very heart of America's nuclear arsenal using this doctored version of enhanced promise to do so, he says, quote, he devised a plan for Robert Maxwell to sell the software to Los Alamos. The device would contain the trap door, which was so brilliantly designed that it could not be detected. If detected, the trap door itself would simply erase itself. Despite doing so much for Mossad in Israel, Maxwell soon became a liability to the Mossad after his sale of enhanced promise to the Chinese Secret Service. So, yeah, you can imagine that you don't want to piss off Mossad, Mm-mm, you know? No. Maxwell began amassing massive amounts of debt to his City of London and Wall Street creditors, refusing to pay back his loans. He was on the verge of bankruptcy. Maxwell begged his creditors to bail him out, but they refused, so he then turned to Mossad for help. Yeah. oh they refused to bail Maxwell out and knew that his city of London creditors who were adamantly demanding repayment wouldn't either. Inevitably, Maxwell threatened to reveal Mossad's secrets in his newspaper empire. Mossad said, okay, okay, we'll give you a check. Victor Ostrovsky, a former Mossad agent, would later indicate that the promise of financial salvation for Maxwell was part of a carefully conceived plan, as you can imagine. Mm-hmm. Sometime on the night of November 4th, 1991, Maxwell was out on the water on his yacht when he left his cabin and went on deck. The next time he was seen, his dead body was being pulled out of the water. I was going to say. The name of the yacht, and take a guess to what the name of the yacht is. Oh, come on. Could be anything. Robert Maxwell. Think of who his daughter might be. Oh, 
Really? The Lady Ghislaine was the name. Really? Yeah. That's his daughter. Ghislaine Maxwell is his daughter. Okay, interesting. Robert Maxwell was Ghislaine Maxwell's father. According to an August 22, 2019 article in The Guardian titled, quote, The Murky Life and Death of Robert Maxwell and How It Shaped His Daughter Ghislaine, the article, yes, see, this is, (laughs) I told you, this goes everywhere. It's making a whole lot of sense This goes everywhere. The article says, quote, Roy Greenslade, a former editor of one of Maxwell's newspapers, The Daily Mirror, said, quote, So I am a suicide theorist. I believe Maxwell threw himself off the boat. But Ken Lennox, then the Mirror's senior photographer who saw the publisher's naked corpse shortly after it was pulled from the sea, that's got to be lovely, is convinced that it was an accident. He says, quote, He used to get up every night and pee over the stern of the ship. Everybody... (laughs) I guess rich people. He used to get up at night and pee. He used to get up every night and pee over the stern of the ship. Everybody knew this, and he weighed about twenty-two stone at the time. I don't know what that even is in in pounds. Right. The railings were wire, so I think he lost his balance because he was very top-heavy. Lennox says, "I don't think he committed suicide." But when the autopsy report came out, it revealed that there was no water in the lungs, so Maxwell was dead before he hit the water. According to the conspiracy theories, Maxwell was told that Mossad agents would be meeting him out on his yacht to give him a huge check, but instead overpowered him, gave him an injection of something behind his ear that killed him and dumped him over the side of the yacht. Hmm. So now this leads to the theory that Robert Maxwell and his daughter Ghislaine got Jeffrey Epstein to work as an agent for Mossad, luring U.S. politicians and stuff into doing things with kids and then blackmailing them, which I totally think is what happened. I really do. I really do. One intelligence source was quoted as saying, quote, some of the proceeds from the illicit sales of promise were made available to Jeffrey Epstein for use in compromising targets of political blackmail. But the Epstein stuff is going to be a whole well, other episode. Whole rabbit hole. But I mean, I, that, I really think that's what it was. Mm. I honestly I've do. I've never I think, heard this, yeah, because, but it makes so much sense. You know, Ghislaine's, Ghislaine's dad was Robert Maxwell. And Robert Maxwell is a rabbit hole in himself, as you mm-hmm. can see on here. And, yeah. and it's believed that... They got him in with, as with Mossad to have this island where you know somebody come you can fool around with this underage kid if you want videotape everything vid- everything's is. videotaped and yeah. it's like hey now you're in our pocket which is like the perfect way to get somebody under your control you yeah have this video in your pocket yep. so yeah so back to Ghislaine. now we focus on her sisters and I never knew anything about her sisters. Mm-mm. Uh, and I was this. I was like researching and writing this when the stuff was going on about Ghislaine's Jeez, trial. Yeah. So it was just so weird that I was like writing this while that was going on. It's a synchronicity. It is totally a synchronicity. So back to Ghislaine. We now focus on her sisters. According to a May 25th, 2021 article on unlimitedhangout.com called, quote, The Cover-Up Continues, The Truth About Bill Gates, Microsoft, and Jeffrey Epstein. The article says, quote, Twin sisters Christine and Isabel Maxwell, along with their husbands at the time, created the McKinley Group in January 1992. Christine and Isabel had both previously worked for the front company called Information on Demand, which had been used by their father, Robert Maxwell, to sell the backdoored Promise software back to the United States government. The McKinley Group, however, was not just a venture of Isabel, Christine, and their husbands, as Ghislaine Maxwell also held a substantial interest in the company, according to a Sunday Times article published in November 2000. That same article also noted that Ghislaine, throughout the 1990s, had been discreetly building up a business empire as opaque as her father's, and that she is secretive to the point of paranoia and her business affairs are deeply mysterious. Hmm. She chose to describe herself as a, quote, internet operator during this period, even though her office in Manhattan refuses to confirm even the name or the nature of her business. McKinley created what became known as the Magellan Internet Directory, remembered as the first site to publish lengthy reviews and ratings of websites. And I remember Magellan was one of, like, the first search engines. Yeah, it sounds familiar. Yeah, Magellan was one of the first search engines. Magellan's value-added content approach attracted several large corporations, resulting in major alliances with AT&T, Time Warner, IBM, Netcom, and the Microsoft Network that were all negotiated by Isabel Maxwell. Microsoft's major alliance with McKinley came in late 1995 when Microsoft announced that Magellan would power the search option for the company's MSN services. That Isabel and Christine Maxwell were able to forge close personal and business ties with Bill Gates and Microsoft ever after having been part of the front company that played a central role in promise-related espionage and after explicitly managing their subsequent companies with the admitted intention to rebuild their spy father's network and legacy 
strongly points to the probability of at least some Microsoft products having been compromised in some fashion, likely through alliances with Maxwell-run tech companies with some feature of promise. Hmm. So you see how promise is like, yeah. like tied in with everything. everything. Yeah. A book written in 1997 by Fabrizio Calvi and Thierry Pfister claimed that the National Security Agency, or the NSA, had been seeding computers abroad with promise-embedded smart chips, codenamed Petri, capable of covertly downloading data and transmitting it using the electrical wiring of the computer as an antenna. And U.S. intelligence agents would be, like, nearby in a van, Mm -hmm. and that would be broadcasting whatever the people that had the computer with that chip would be doing, so they would be able to retrieve it. So that's promise. Uh, There are reports that some financial institutions, law enforcement institutions, and intelligence communities to this day still use promise. And as we said, promise either became or set the stage for prism. And prism is what we talked about in the the episode about electronic surveillance. Mm -hmm. Prism is what monitors what everybody does. So basically, promise became prism at some point. But promise was where this all started, that... People started. So, does Promise no longer exist? It literally did become Prism. No, I think Promise still exists okay. because some of these people still. Prism is just companies, a new, different. Yeah, Prism is like the upgraded version of Promise, and people even point to the fact that Promise and Prism are so closely, like, named. Like, yeah, like like Prism is a further version of Promise. Okay. But this is, you know, as far as like each individual conspiracy theory, I don't know, but all this stuff is true. The promise stuff is true. And what this, you know, having the back door in there, that was true. And all this stuff was true. So, uh, yeah, so that's the promise mm-hmm. stuff is crazy. But like the guy said at the beginning of this episode, he said it's, you can go nuts looking into the promise and Inslaw stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, and Inslaw, scary. Inslaw was not the bad guy. Inslaw were the ones that right. made this. And then the government stole the program from them and turned it Corrupt into a it. system to monitor yeah, everything. And the then every thing. intelligence agency around the world ends up with this. And companies have, or intelligence agencies have back doors to go see what other companies are doing. So this is basically the start of everybody, of people not having anonymity. Anonymity? Yeah. You know, anonymity. like people, yeah, people couldn't be... Everything was being monitored. This was the start of everything being monitored was because of this. Now, finally, back to Danny Casalero. Okay. <laughs> so it was a bit of a detour, uh-huh. I realize, but you need to... You got to even remind needed... me now who... who. He was the investigative reporter. Okay, that Remember his you. IT tech friends yes. are like, you need to look into this Inslaw case. Okay. So then he started looking into the Inslaw case. Got it. When Danny started looking into the Inslaw case and the claims of Michael R., who he codenamed Danger Man... It brought him to the Cabezon or Cabazon Indian Reservation where Michael was said to have put a back door on promise. Looking into that area, looking into the reservation, there was a triple homicide there that Danny Casalero was fascinated with. From the Dark Ideas website, quote, Fred Alvarez was the vice chairman of the Cabezon Tribal Council and very unhappy with the direction that John Nichols, the current leader, was taking in the tribe. He also suspected that Nichols was embezzling tribe income. Alvarez contacted a reporter in June 1981 after voicing his opinion that John Nichols should be removed from his post. He then believed his life was in danger, noticing that his motorcycle had been tampered with. He also reported that people had been driving past his house firing guns. An appointment was made with an attorney for July 1st, 1981. Alvarez's aim was getting rid of Nichols, but he would never make that meeting. Instead, he was found outside his house alongside girlfriend Patty Castro and friend Rolf Boger. All three had been shot in the head, execution style. Boger's daughter later met with a man named Jimmy Hughes, who was said to have been the killer, and she secretly recorded her conversation with him. He said on the recording, quote, Your parents were involved in some very dangerous things. That's the only thing I can tell you. Your dad and I were friends, but he touched somebody. They gave an order, and that was what happened to him. And he says, I killed people all over the world, right or wrong, because the government ordered me to. It's a lot bigger than the murder of this guy or the murder of that guy. It's big. You're talking political people. Hmm. A man named David McGowan was an investigator for the Riverside District Attorney who had been asked to investigate the conduct of certain police officers in Desert Hot Springs, California, which is 20 miles away from the Cabazon or Cabazon Reservation. It's believed that McGowan had uncovered a link between police corruption there and the Cabazon triple murder in 1981, 
but just days before McGowan was due to testify to the FBI, he apparently decided to shoot his mother, wife, and two children before taking his own life in what seemed like an apparent murder-suicide. Mm, exactly. Call Exa- BS on exactly. That. Why Although three neighbors whole, why told out the whole family, three though? neighbors told police that they had seen a van parked at the back garden of McGowan's house. It had flashed its headlights on the night of the murder, as if signaling someone. Mm. When a neighbor approached, it quickly sped off. Despite three witnesses to that event, that lead was never investigated. I don't understand why you take out the whole family, though. To make it look like it was a murder suicide that this guy killed his family. But what? I feel like you'd have to have a reason to do that. No, not if you're a hired. Not if you're the government no, 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 I mean, killer. That that you know. He, to make that story viable, he would have had to have some kind of. Oh yeah, there was some trouble in that family. Like there well, had they to went be in a to history. kill him, and the family saw that he was going to get killed. He had no choice but to kill the family and then kill him and make it look like a murder suicide. It's just I'd have a hard time believing that. I one hundred percent. There was think that no was, history. I one hundred percent think that was that was sketchy. That oh, there, totally. That was not a yeah. So in 1990, Danny Castellaro met a man named Lieutenant Alan Standorf, who had worked for the NSA via the U.S. Army at an intelligence gathering listening post. Standorf gave Casalero copies of classified documents relating to Promise. These documents also corroborated what was being told by Michael R. Standorf was last seen shortly after New Year 1991. 25 days later, on January 28th, he was found beaten to death in the backseat of his car at Reagan National Airport. It had appeared that he had been killed on the 3rd or 4th of January and his car driven there after his death to make a statement. So everybody that's... Is like mysteriously yeah. dying. Despite this, odd, despite this odd behavior, his murder is considered to be just, quote, street robbery gone wrong. Mm-hmm. The FBI, however, considers the case to be open and therefore conveniently it's not eligible for Freedom of Information Act requests. <sighs> of course. So Casalero had also been talking with a former DEA agent named Lester Coleman. Seven days after talking with Coleman, Casalero booked a trip to Martinsburg, West Virginia to meet up with contacts or a contact that he believed was going to break his octopus investigation wide open. And octopus is what he gave, the name that he gave all of this because he said it's like an octopus with tentacles. There's There's like tentacles going everywhere with this Inslaw case. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it is. I mean, it's going, it went... October surprise, it went to, uh, we'll, we'll get to some more here, but you'll see here in a second. So then he was he planned a trip to go to Martinsburg, West Virginia, to meet up with contacts that he believed was going to break the investigation wide open. A contact he made the day before he died, Bill Turner gave him documentation of the fraud at Hughes Aircraft, the company started by Howard Hughes. Hughes Aircraft has a long history of exclusive and secret deals with the U.S. government for aerospace technologies, and it's believed that both Hughes Aircraft and Wackenhut were tied in with Area 51, which Casalero was rumored to have pages about that tied the top-secret facility into the octopus. Other things that Casalero began looking into about how they were tied into the octopus are the Bay of Pigs invasion, the Kennedy assassination, Watergate, the bombing of Pan Am Flight 103 over Lockerbie, Scotland, and the death of Princess Diana. Oh my gosh. So, yeah. According to the Dark Ideas website, quote, by the time Danny Casalero booked his hotel room at the Sheraton Martinsburg, West Virginia, it seems impossible that he was not well aware of the dangers he was exposing himself to. His housekeeper described him regularly checking his car for bombs and receiving threatening phone calls in the days before his death. She said that she herself answered the phone on one of those days to just to be told, quote, you son of a bitch, you're dead. <laughs> Yeah. Alrighty then. She also said that on the day that he left for Martinsburg, he had with him a briefcase of documents and an accordion type file paper holder that was full of papers. Most tellingly, in a phone call to his brother, he stated, quote, I have been getting some very threatening phone calls. If anything happens to me, don't believe it was accidental. Yep. But I've also seen it reported as, quote, if something happens to me in Martinsburg, it will not be an accident. Same thing. Notes he left behind suggested he had contact with former CIA agents, arms dealers, and extremist groups. His phone records also showed that he had been in regular contact with Robert Nichols of Wackenhut Corporation. Bill Hamilton of Inslaw says that he was told by Israeli intelligence that Danny was meeting the FBI at the Sheraton. Whoever he was meeting and whatever he had in those papers must have been proof that none of the other informants had. Otherwise, why were people like Michael R., Coleman, and Bagley not killed as well? Which makes sense. Mm -hmm. So Danny is meeting a contact in Martinsburg, supposedly the FBI. He's also been getting death threats. A neighbor, Olga 
Olga Morkros had answered his phone one day when she was over and heard a male voice threatening to, quote, cut him into pieces, followed by a call minutes later where a different male voice said to, quote, drop dead. And other times she would answer the phone and hear nothing at the other end except for the faint sounds of music, like it was a radio in the room of the caller. That's creepy. Yeah. I don't ever want to be involved in anything where people are calling me, <laughs> no, telling me they're going to cut me into yeah. pieces. Yep. But he's looking into stuff that... Right. Yeah. So also from the Dark Ideas website, quote, On August 10th, 1991, a hotel cleaner entered room 517 to find Danny Castellaro dead in the bathtub, floating in a mixture of bath water and blood. It appeared that he had slit his wrist 10 to 12 times. So many suicides. The cleaner noted the odd fact that the towels had been used to mop up blood from the floor. Housekeeper Barbara Bittinger later said, quote, It looked like someone had tried to wipe up the blood on the floor and then unsuccessfully slid the towels under the sink. When the police arrived, the bath was drained without filtering for any evidence. Nevertheless, seemingly pointless items such as a beer can, a beer coaster, and two trash bags were found along with a razor blade used. There were two plastic trash bags floating in the water and a shoelace tied around his neck, the theory being that he thought to quicken his death by putting the bags over his head, tying the shoelace, and asphyxiating himself but had changed his mind. A suicide note was written on the notepad by the phone which read, quote, To those who I love the most, please forgive me for the worst possible thing I could ever have done. Most of all, I'm sorry to my son. I know deep down that God will let me in. Hmm. Casalero was a Catholic, so may well have pleaded to his God, but he would have known that it's a sin to commit suicide. Those facts aside, it's a very dull note for a flamboyant writer to leave, and it does not fit with his personality as his friends knew it. The large accordion file of papers and the briefcase containing his documents were both missing from his room, despite a front desk clerk and a cleaner both confirming that they had seen them in the room. Then the room was clean and his body was embalmed before his family was even notified of his death. Oh my God. On hearing that he had slit his wrists, they felt confused that he had chosen that method because he had a fear of blood to the point of avoiding blood tests. They insisted on an autopsy, which was carried out by the West Virginia University Hospital. The path- uh, and I, I, There are pictures of this online. The pathologist noted that the cuts on one hand were deep enough to cut tendons, rendering his fingers useless, and he would, should have been unable to perform the other cuts. Or clean up blood with towels. There were also no hesitation marks common with that method of suicide. Traces of hydrocodone and an antidepressant named Tricilic were found, despite Castellaro having no prescription for either drug, and nobody ever remembering him taking either drug for anything. Shady. It's, it's thought, though... Whatever he had in those papers, it must have been proof that none of the other informants had because he was yeah, killed. Obviously. Yeah. I want to see if I can. You gonna show me gross photos? It's it's. I'm not sure. It's I a little see it. gross. I'm not gonna post these in the group because. Gross. They're black and white. I mean, they're not super gross, but they're still graphic. Yeah, black and white does sort of take. They're, the... they're still graphic. Okay. But when I think of somebody slitting the wrist, I mean, I don't think that is like. Oh. Oh wow. That is like hacking the wrist. And they said the tendons were exposed. There's they, so much. They exposed. said it was basically down to the bone. Ugh. They said it was. Ba- and they he said did that, not do that they said to that himself. he should not have been able to cut no. his other wrist because his tendons were were cut. Well, do you think he would have started with that wrist? I don't know. Hmm. I don't know. But it look, doesn't like, add up. Look, that was the first time I ever saw those pictures, and I was like, no. That's I horrifying. said that is not slitting your wrist. That is like hacking, hacking them, hacking open. into your wrist. After Castellaro's death, former DEA agent Lester Coleman said that he had talked to him seven days before his death and that he had feared for his life. Coleman provided an affidavit to Bill Hamilton of Inslaw saying, quote, Between February and September of 1987, I was seconded, seconded by the Defense Intelligence Agency to the DEA in Cyprus. During my two stints as a DIA covert intelligence officer, I became aware of the fact that the DIA was using its proprietary company, Ureme, Ureme Trading Company Limited, to sell the computer software called Promise to the drug abuse control agencies of various countries. The DEA objective in inducing the implementation of this computerized system in the drug abuse agencies of the Middle East countries was to make it possible for the U.S. government to access their sensitive drug control and intelligence files of those Middle East governments. I became aware in 1991 that Michael R., known to me as a longtime CIA asset, was arrested for the manufacture of illegal drugs. His arrest should be regarded as suspect. The probability is that they manufactured a case against him to prevent him from becoming a credible witness about the U.S. government's covert sales of the promised software. Mm -hmm. 
The investigative journalist Danny Castellaro had leads about things I know about, including the Department of Justice groups operating overseas, the sale of Promise, the BCCI, and the Iran-Contra scandal. And just a couple, a couple last things. Uh, Charles Brown, Charlie Brown, the undertaker, embalmed the body. Brown would later give the most ordinary of reasons for doing so before the family was even notified when he said, quote, I just didn't want to come back to work on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> though embalming a body okay. though embalming a body without the permission of the next next of kin is illegal in west virginia i imagine that would be illegal anywhere yeah, but yeah so he just said his excuse for why he embalmed the body before the family even knew was he didn't want to come back to work on sunday so there's that in the days before he left for martinsburg all of his friends said that he was that danny was his usual cheery self and that he was excited both about the octopus theory stuff and a new woman that he had met And the morning he left for Martinsburg, he stopped and paid his homeowner's premium, which people said is odd if you're planning, if you're going to kill yourself. It's like, you know, would you, would you stop and pay your homeowner's premium if you're planning on killing yourself? Does he have a family? Uh, Yeah. He wouldn't want his family to have to worry about it, maybe. A week after Casalero's death, a New York psychiatrist and Casalero's cousin, Louis Petrillo, uh, wrote to the Martinsburg police to tell them, quote, Danny did not manifest any symptoms or character traits during the day immediately preceding his death during the past 12 months or even at any time in his personal history that could in any way be associated with a potential for suicide. Hmm. Also, the coroner found a bruise on the top of his head that probably would have induced moderate hemorrhaging under the skin, Hmm. which never showed up anywhere else. Hmm. A December 1991 Vanity Fair article called, quote, The Strange Death of Danny Casalero says... While his friends were saying that it was murder disguised to look like suicide, maybe it was really a suicide made to look like murder. That by killing himself and leaving enough ambiguities to raise the possibility of murder, Danny would make his own death the sensational final chapter of the book he never wrote. The one thing that would validate the seriousness of the quest he was on, which was uncovering the octopus. I don't know if I buy that. I guess. That's quite a sacrifice. And lastly, according to an October 15th, 1991 article in the Village Voice titled, quote, The Last Days of Danny Casalero, the article says, At Danny's rainy funeral, as his mother, brothers, sisters, and close friends watch from beneath a canopy, a man in a tan raincoat and a be-ribboned black soldier in army dress uniform walked up to the casket. The soldier laid a medal on the lid, saluted, and both men quickly walked away. Hmm. No one recognized either man. Danny had never served in or covered anything to do with the military. The medal was buried with the coffin. Interesting. Yep. And hmm. before we get into theories, I just want to end with this quote. I don't, I don't remember exactly. It was one of these ones that I referenced, but I really like this quote. It says, quote, perhaps his mistake was not that he didn't realize what he was getting into. It was that he didn't understand what he was hunting. When leaving for his ill-fated trip to Martinsburg, he proclaimed in a phone call, quote, I'm going to bring back the head of the octopus. But what he had uncovered was not just an octopus. It was a hydra. There would be no bringing back any heads, no big reveal. If, as his and other investigators' research suggests, there is any such shadowy organization, the stakes are too high. Remaining leaders would ensure that they remain in the shadows no matter how many heads you cut off. Whenever I approach a subject like this, a quote from the brilliant sci-fi film Cube comes to mind. The quote being, quote, There is no conspiracy. Nobody is in charge. It's a headless blunder operating under the illusion of some master plan. In the cases I examine here, there is usually, at the very least, good circumstantial evidence for some sort of cover-up. But are they all linked in the way that Danny Casalero believed? Was he being manipulated by clever disinformation agents? Are they happy for people to believe in an illusion of a master plan? I suspect more information will emerge over the years as individual strands become eligible for further Freedom of Information Act requests. According to muckrock.com, there are still over 20,000 pages at the National Archives related to Danny Casalero and the Promise Affair that are not yet available to the public. Maybe the answers are buried in there. One thing, for, one thing is for sure, this case is the mother of all rabbit holes. When faced with such a labyrinth, it can be difficult to know where to begin. One part makes little sense without the others, and therein lies the strength of the octopus, if it exists. It's hard to focus on one part when you don't know what part you are looking at. Mm, interesting. So what do you think that is? <laughs> that is, I, I 100% think, a lot, a lot of people do think that he killed himself. Mm. So do you think... Do you think it was just suicide? Mm-mm. Do you think it was 
a murder made to look like suicide? Or do you think he killed himself making it look like murder to give his octopus theory validation? It doesn't even, some of it doesn't even sound physically feasible though. But I want to. And if he had cut himself that badly, he would not have had, I think you would lose a lot of blood really fast. Yeah. And you would not have had the, the even physical strength to even try to clean up. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I'm, who would, I just don't, but people, Use your words, Krista. I, I realize that people that are suicidal can be appear happy and bubbly and stuff, but people just said that knew him said yeah, it was sometimes such it's a total shock. Yeah, people said it was like such a you would not expect that from him. There's just too many things that don't seem right about it. No, and and he, you know, there's other stuff in here I didn't even touch on. He was looking into that triple murder at the at the reservation, and he mm. believed that that had to do with Insla with the promise stuff. That that was somehow tied in, but was it? He was starting to see the octopus in everything. Like it said, Area Fifty One, Princess Diana's death. Mm-hmm. You know, and if, if there's some shadowy organization running this whole thing, right? You know, but I don't think he killed himself. No, I don't. I think never so thought he killed himself, no. especially after seeing those pictures of his wrist. No, yeah, that's not slitting your wrist. That is like gashing. That is like right, like a meat cleaver hacking at your wrist. I mean to to correctly do it that way, you just have to slice through. Yeah, and yeah, I think you bleed out kind of quickly and lose yep. consciousness kind of yep. quickly. And so I just don't where, see him being able is, to where do. Is, where's his papers? Where are the documents? Right. Why are they not in there? I just don't see him being able to do what no. he appeared to have done yeah. with those kinds of injuries. When I first got into this thing way way back many years ago, it was really not well known at all. Hmm. I mean, this was like very obscure the maxwell tie-in is very interesting the it jeffrey like, epstein tie-in yeah is like robert maxwell is like a really fascinating figure when it, we come to conspiracy st- and mossad like i said mm-hmm. mossad is one of those things that i just don't even like googling on my computer no. because who's watching yeah like they they're they're bad you know so it's it's all just very shady and dirty and just yeah. makes you feel like yeah it makes you feel gross well to you think know there was the, a lot of this was originally tied in with the iran contra Mm-hmm. arms dealing stuff which which was which happened mm-hmm. you know the october surprise i think has validity to it that that reagan said you know don't hurt the hostages keep them until after the election and then release them because they were released re- immediately after reagan was That's elected weird. you know but that iran was given a copy of promise but promise is a legit thing and promise is like i said that, that is like the forerunner of surveillance mm-hmm. of the surveillance state so I just thought, I hope listeners thought this was okay. I just thought this was like a really fascinating story. I it don't, is. I don't think Danny killed himself. No, I just I don't never think so have. Either. I never mm-hmm. have. Um, I think whoever he was supposed to meet or his con, his contact that was going to break everything open was planning to kill him all mm. along. You know, especially with him telling his brother, like him telling his brother something happens to me in Martinsburg. Right. It's not mm-hmm. an accident. But that also leads to the fact that maybe he planned to kill himself to make people look into the octopus theory because he couldn't handle it anymore. And it made it look like it was a legit thing that he was murdered. But, you know, the, like the trash bags and stuff in the in the I bathtub. I just feel like makes he had so much more he was going to potentially expose. Yeah. Why would he just end all that? Yeah. It doesn't make sense that he would walk away from something he had put his life's work into. Yeah, and and like we he you know he had chill, he had kids. Right. You know, so I don't know. It's just I don't know. He didn't kill himself. No, I don't buy that for a second. But I just think it's fascinating, like how this touches on so many different. Yeah. You know Talk about an octopus. So many, yeah, and like I said, it's still going on because I with the 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 Ghislaine stuff. Yeah. Which fascinated and me. Who knows that, what else it's tied into that we're not even aware oh. of probably tons of stuff yeah probably tons of things it could be you know covid for all we know that if right, people that believe know. that that covid is like a, a conspiracy theory it could be mm-hmm. tied in with that the elections you know so god only knows but like i said every single thing we talk about here is a rabbit hole yeah it really is you so can dedicate you a whole that episode is, <laughs> that is danny Casalero and the octopus hmm. What do you think? Yeah, when you texted that to me, I was like, wow, I have no idea what any of that is. Considering you didn't know anything about it, do you think it's interesting? Oh, I think so, yeah. Like, I love the Promise stuff. I think that's, like, fascinating to me that, you know, and I feel sorry for Inslaw because they got hosed by the Department of Justice, you know, and and the the judge basically said, yeah, they screwed you from the start. They made these contracts, they backed out knowing that you couldn't do anything to them Mm -hmm. and that you would just gradually run out of money and then they would get the the software. So it's just so shady. I think the octopus is what makes it so interesting to see how all of these things are connected. Yeah. 
Yeah, and 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 like I said, this isn't done. I mean, like you say, right. it could, it still very well could be going on today. Mm-hmm. You know, the Epstein stuff will probably be a, a and now with technology where it is. Yeah, yeah, but people, there someone's are, listening to us right now. Yeah, the, there are people <laughs> that still use. Um, Promise. I mean, Promise is still out there. Just the fact that you've said certain keywords, the, our every, phones are every, listening well, to us. Time, like, like back in, I don't think it's anymore, but back in the day, it was said that if you were on an overseas call and said the initials NSA, mm. it would automatically start recording your call. Interesting. But we talked about that with Prism, that everything we do is is saved in a computer database somewhere, all our phone calls, all our text messages. Mm-hmm. I mean, we basically have no privacy privacy anymore and, and that all stems from you have to be completely off yeah, the grid and that all basically stems from promise yeah. that's where this whole ball mm-hmm. got rolling so there you go that is a story that i'm fascinated with it is danny castellaro and the octopus wow okay songs first or questions first uh let's do questions were you not prepared for that? Why'd you give me an option? I don't know. Now you got me all messed up here. <laughs> you can do songs. We'll do questions. Okay, we'll do songs first. Okay. Uh, uh, two songs. Did you pick any songs? Do you have any songs? No, what was I going to... I was thinking about this, though. I was like, I was going to recommend a show instead of a song. Like a show I'm really into. It's like going back to that show, though. I said this in a previous episode that it was weird that I, when I was researching this episode, I was watching Alias. Mm. And in Alias, uh, Sydney's friend goes to see a guy that's in jail. And it was basically because he w- made software that they put a back door on. Mm. So it was like tied into what I was researching at the time, which I thought was so weird. That's all I got. Oh. But um, I'll go to my songs. Okay. <laughs> okay. My first song. Um, I, I was, I want to do like a faster song and a slower song in a lot of these. My slower song was one that I realized that like I listen to music in my car on a flash drive. I used to burn CDs, mm-hmm. you know, mix CDs for myself to listen to. And I realized that this do song. we have to explain that to the millennials what that means? Burning CDs. Burning CDs. Nah, we I didn't put them on a bonfire <laughs> no, in a didn't. fireplace. We didn't. <laughs> but I realized that this song was like on every mix that I made for myself. And I love this song. To me, this is an autumn song. This is a okay. song. You should be listening to on your Walkman, you know, it's dating myself, but your Walkman earphones, uh, when you're out walking on a sunny autumn day, leaves are crunching, like this is an autumn song. And I just think this is such a beautiful song. And it is the song New Hampshire by Matt Pond, PA. Okay. I don't think I've ever had that one on here before, but I didn't really find any YouTube quotes about it because it's kind of a, not a well-known song and it was used in One Tree Hill, I think. So people were all talking about One Tree Hill or I have no idea. I never watched One Tree Hill. Me either. But I just think it's such a pretty song and it's such like a fall song and it's just one that makes you think, I guess. And it is the song, I'm going to post it in the group, New Hampshire by Matt Pond, PA. My other song, I got a, there's a story to it, but the song is A Letter to Ashley and the band is Your Broken Hero. And basically, there's this guy named Matt Cutsall and he runs this YouTube channel where he's like a 2005, 2006 emo dude living in today's society. Mm -hmm. You know, he's got like the emo stuff perfect. And it's, it's funny, like... It's, it's hilarious. And then he, he so it's posted, sort of like a parody. Yes. Okay. And he posted that he was going to be doing his first ever emo video, his emo song. Okay. So then he released this, but he put this video out called a letter to Ashley and people were like, before it came out, people were like, this is going to be like purposely bad. This is going to be funny. And he came out and everybody was like, holy crap, this is really good. And there's, there's on YouTube, there are reaction videos of like emo bands listening to the song for the first time where they start. And then they're like, I wish we wrote this. They're <laughs> yeah. like, this is amazing. And uh, it's just so good that I listen to it. It's like in my car. I listen to it all the time now. And it starts off with this, you know, like a piano, like your 2005 emo, like hard rock stuff. It starts out with the piano. And then all of a sudden, like the heaviness comes in and it's just like spot on perfect. So some of the YouTube quotes for this are, it's impressive how this actually makes me feel like it's from the mid 2000s. Such a great time. I miss it. Somebody else says, why is it that parodies are often the purest and best songs of their genres? Somebody else says, I just watched it. That was ironically and unironically awesome. And then somebody else says, this song would have been blaring out of every car window back in the summer of 2007. But it, and it's so good. I'm going to post this in the group. 
And, you know, it's one of those ones that everybody thinks at first is going to be jokey and then every, and it is funny. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's a funny song because it's like emo, like he's writing letters to all these girls about how (laughs) they broke his heart and his heart filled with darkness and all this stuff. But it also happens to be really good. And it happens to be really good. And it is. He like nails all this stuff perfectly. He's texting these girls. He's got the old school phone where he slides down with the keyboard and he's texting these girls and, uh. He's showing up in all their lives now, and they do the thing where he, he's singing into a light bulb from a hanging from the ceiling, you know, like the, the typical. I'm and the thing Hayley is, Williams like, I love this. back in the it early. I still do. I still love emo music. Like back in the two thousand early, like mid two thousands, I loved bands like the Get Up Kids are a great band. A uh, one band that I'm still obsessed with that I love is Taking Back Sunday, and they're like one of the premier emo bands. Mm. You know, so I'm going to post that. It is, and even the title of the band, Your Broken Hero, is like mm-hmm. 100%. And at the end of the video, it's funny because, you know, it goes from the song into a girl sitting on the couch listening to it on her earphones, and then her boyfriend comes in, and her boyfriend is the singer for Dashboard Confessional, which is like one of the, the huge emo bands of the early 2000s. So it is a letter to Ashley from Your Broken Hero. Watch it. It is funny, and it is great. And you'll post it to the Facebook And I'll post page. it to the Facebook group. Cool. Cool. And now questions. We actually have two of them. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I want to I wanna rec- recommend a show. Okay. So we, um, it, this has been talked about on the Facebook page, but it's a Netflix series called Archive 81. I've heard about it. It's I've never watched it. really good. So I haven't finished it yet. I was binging it for a while and then I got distracted by other stuff. But this is a quick um, synopsis. It's an archivist takes a job restoring damaged videotapes, but that it's all very weird. Like you can tell right from the beginning, this is not this isn't on the up and up. Yeah. But finds themselves getting pulled into a mystery involving the missing director and a mysterious cult that they were Ooh. documenting. And I'm it's, listening. You got it's me. It's got yeah. a really good creep factor. There's yeah. a lot of like, oh, like you're really creeped out moments. Um, there's some weird time stuff that starts happening, and it's really really good. I'm gonna have to watch that. That actually sounds really good. Yeah, it's very good. I highly recommend it. If you're if you're looking for something creepy to watch, they they're really nailing it with that one. Cool. Archive 81. Cool. I will check that out. All right, questions. Questions uh from Carl Wagner who loved oh, that Carl. we loved his uh best of two bad situ which one will we take oh, in yeah, the best yeah, of yeah. two. So <laughs> then he wrote his next one is would you rather adopt the real Annabelle doll or live on the island of the dolls in Mexico? <gasps> have you seen the island of the dolls in Mexico? Oh, yes, many yeah. times. Many shows have been there. Um, ugh. So not only I'd rather adopt Annabelle because not Seriously? only yeah because not only does this island have a bunch of creepy dolls hanging everywhere, I think that's like infested with bugs and yeah. like rodents, <laughs> yeah. and it's not a place that you would ever want to live. Yeah. So I would stuff Annabelle. <laughs> In a box somewhere <laughs> yeah, or a glass probably case. Probably just get her mad. Yeah, I don't know. Well, I'll give her like, I don't know, a nice dress or something. I actually was going to go with the Island of the Dolls. Did but I now, sell now you, that you on Yeah, Annabelle? you talked about the bugs. Now that you talked about the bugs being on the island, it is creepy. Like, it just, just going like to the island and then seeing... It seems like a very inhospitable area. Well, and seeing all the, ha- the, like, the, the old falling apart dolls hanging from the trees, like the thousands <sighs> yeah. of dolls hanging from the trees. I'm going to go with Annabelle. Yeah, I'd take Annabelle yep. any day. Cool. And our other question did show up on our QOOH site from Anonymous. And this is a good question that we never got. I don't think we've ever had this question before. And I okay. don't, honestly don't even know what I'm going to answer for this Ooh. question. But it is, what is a common misperception about you? About me? A common misperception about me. I don't know. Here's the thing. <laughs> anytime, I don't anytime, really, Krista, anytime Krista anytime Krista does that with her thing. hand. Anytime Krista <laughs> does that with her hand. And it's like, here's the thing. I don't really talk about myself much. Like, I, I talk about myself, but I don't But what's really... a misperception that people have about you? That's the thing. Like, maybe not listeners, because the listeners don't really have a lot of information on me. Maybe, I, maybe I this misperception share... is you're snooty because you don't talk to people. Or I wonder if they think, um, just because I don't talk about the stuff that keeps me up at night, that I don't have those things. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you're an open book. You talk about things when you're really stressed out or something. That's yeah. good. I don't talk about that yeah. stuff. And so maybe there's a misconception that I don't have those things in my life, but it's just that I'm very private and I don't like you to do. share I it. You do. I hear about quite oh, a yeah. few of them, so I know you yeah, do. Yeah, they exist. I, I just get don't that. talk. It's, so it's, maybe there's a misconception. It is weird because uh, was it one of my students, somebody said something about how I, I'm freely give information. Like I'm, I don't 
hold stuff back. Yeah. And I don't. You I mean, don't. I am You're an, an open, open book. book. Anybody wants to know anything about me, My I'll book tell is you. closed and it's got a padlock on yeah. it. Like, that's the difference between us. But then it's weird that we're like BFFs. I know. But maybe we... But I trust you and oh, I've I trust known you, you too, for a very but maybe, long time. Maybe I need to be more like you instead of being so open No, I think that's <laughs> what people everything. love about you, though. Possibly. I think also a misconception about me is that like people at work would never know that I'm kind of a shy introvert because I force myself to be outgoing <laughs> yeah. and confident in yeah. work s- situations. Yep. So that's probably a misconception about me too. I think misperception people have about us as a duo is that we're, yeah, we want to travel the country and, <laughs> and meet people and do <laughs> yeah. do programs. And, I'm perfectly and happy just be being on, in my basement. Be up on stage with hundreds of people in the audience. God. And that just makes me want to poop just my pants. About. Okay, we have both bodily reactions to that. <laughs> yeah. But on I, opposite ends of the. Body. I, I thought about this on my drive down here today. Like I think, and I, this sounds like I'm being mean to myself, but I'm I'm not. I think a common misperception perception. So like uh, Sean Connery there, I was like <laughs> channeling misperception, uh, uh, accurate perception about me is that I'm really smart. I don't think I am. I don't think I am. I don't think I am. I think think there was a time I was when I was younger. And I think I... I don't think you become unsmart, though. I think think what potential I had, I pissed away when I was younger. Mm. I don't think I'm as smart as people think I am. But, you know, like like Aaron introduces me to people as the smartest person he's ever met. And I'm like, oh, I'm not really, (laughs) you know. I don't think I'm smart. I really don't. I disagree. I really don't. You're smarter than me. I think I know a lot of uh, facts about stuff, but I don't think I'm smart. I think I was. I mean, back in the day, I took took when I was at, uh, going to the center. I took an IQ test to get into Mensa, you know, and you needed a score of I don't one. Think your IQ drops though. It does. I just I don't think I'm as smart. I think I'm good at tests and puzzles. I don't think I'm smart. <laughs> but my my IQ score came back as one thirty seven, and one forty is genius. So I didn't get into Mensa. Hmm. But I just think I I think people overestimate my smartness. <laughs> I guess <How> eloquent. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I'm, not, I'm not particularly being... inarticulate today. <laughs> but that's just today. yeah. Yeah. Well, our uh, coffee Kofi listeners will hear how inarticulate oh I was gosh. when I was stumbling over Strange. every freaking word of this. Well, I don't think you're dumb. Well, thank you. I don't think I'm dumb. I just think people overestimate my intelligence. Intelligence. Yeah. But that, I, and I said, I'm not being mean to myself or putting myself down. I just don't think I'm as smart as people think I am. Interesting. So that's that's what I think is a common misperception. Misperception. I'm, <laughs> I'm not drinking. I'm not slurring my words. I'm drinking. <laughs> I think that's the it. The tea. I think that's it. Yeah. And again, I hope you guys like today's case. I know that's not one that you're really into because a lot of people want people paranormal like conspiracy stuff. Conspiracy theories, though. but I just think this is a, like a. I think this is an important one because I I do think he was murdered. I really do. Yeah, I do too. And I just think, I, I think the more that this is kept out there in the public domain, the better it is for him and his memory and what he was trying to do. Especially since I was completely unaware of any of this. Yeah. But I think there's a lot of hinky stuff going on, you know, oh. and Promise is still out there floating sure. around. Like that. Like it said, Promise is probably tied in with our Microsoft software, mm-hmm. where it still has back doors into stuff where people can see what we're doing. Well. You know. They'd be bored as heck spying on me. Um, are we going to do a strange state this season? I oh, think yeah. We we're going to probably do two of them, okay. I'm thinking. Yep. Have you chosen them? And no. if not, how are you going to choose them? I don't know. Should we have our strangers like sell us on their state? Yeah. Do that. I like that. Also, our coffee subscribers, if there is a side session Ooh, you yeah. want us to do, let me know. Yeah. Seriously, like, let me know. If there's a topic that you think is interesting... And it's not spooky not enough to get on the strange sessions. Let yeah. me know. I will gladly research whatever you want me to look into. Um, yeah. But cool. yeah, we would love to know what states you guys would want for a strange state. Yeah. We've done. We have a lot to do. We've done Idaho, Colorado. Um, we've done a partial Wisconsin. Ohio, a partial Wisconsin, Missouri. 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 I think there's one, maybe one more. But if there, if if you want us to check out your state... We should have a map of the United States. <laughs> cross off which ones. And we've put done. a little tack. I'm serious. Yeah, and yeah. put a, a little tack where, for the states we've done. Yeah, we'll we'll start to lose track after a while. We will. I still love our idea of traveling the country, of our doing our list. van living, our van living, our, our strange sessions, van bus life. living, and then going to Idaho to see the lonely uh, picnic table, Keep and then the lonely going down picnic to picnic table company. You know, going to going finally actually going to Los Angeles, and of course meeting up with Logan. Yes. 
do some Bigfoot hunting. But let us know. If there is a state you want us to look at in our first Strange States episode for this season, I'm guessing it'll be maybe three, four episodes down the road. Okay. The next one I already have mostly done. The next one is a cryptid slash creepy thing that I have touched on in several other episodes and never knew it actually had an official name until recently. Exciting. So that, and then we got to do more haunty yeah. Haunty ghosty stuff. Haunty so we'll ghosty have to stuff. Dive into some of that. But I like to mix it up. I like to have a spooky one, a cryptid one, and then a conspiracy one. So it's not the same thing over All and over. All things strange. All things strange, like we always say. So I think that's basically it. And deets. now we have to segue to the deets and then segue to the side sessions today. Let me look at our list to make sure I haven't forgotten anything. Oh, joke. I almost forgot a joke. You know what you could call our. Uh, the file for our side session today, even though it'll totally give it away what the topic is. What? Finger licking. Ooh. Yep. I see where you're going you with You see where that. I'm going with that. I do. I can't remember where I left off. How did the lobster get into the ocean? How? By a shellicopter. <laughs> I think we maybe did that one. Did we? Okay. Where does the road get angry? When does the road get angry? I don't know. When someone crosses it. Wow. Do you want to, should I do a pickle one? Yeah. I'm ready to groan. These are so dumb. <laughs> we say that I've never, day. I never read These a are joke. So I never read, I've never read a joke out of this. I don't think you have. Like on the air. I'm ready. I'm looking for. I'm ready to be <laughs> highly disappointed. I have two of them. Okay. First one. Knock, knock. Who's there? Pickle. Pickle who? Pick a letter from A to Z. <laughs> I was ready. This one. What's green, has 22 legs, and plays football in cold weather? Think. Think. Use your logic. Why would I pick this one? What's green, has 22 legs, and plays football in cold weather? Who plays football in cold weather? The Packers? The Green Pickle Packers? Close. (laughs) The Green Bay Pickles? The Green Bay Pickles. (laughs) Good job with that one. Oh, Okay. (laughs) <laughs> I think a lot. <laughs> oh, the deets. <laughs> Don't forget I the totally deets. Don't forget the deets. You can email us at the strange sessions. Oh, I got to tell you something after we get off the air. Oh, and I have to let's to interrupt you very quickly. If anyone has been looking at the um letters from Matthew Thornton and and you're making some connections, let us know. I think Dash asked for them. Yeah. Did he get those from you? I don't think so. Oh, okay. Um, so I, I know he wanted to kind of do like a deep dive. the individual pictures, yeah. Yeah, and I don't have the letters. Kurt has them. So if anybody looked at the letters, the pictures of them, I know we didn't give you very great pictures, but yeah. please let us know if you've made any connections. But remind me, I have to tell you something when we're done recording. Okay. You can email us at thestrangesessions at gmail.com. We are on Twitter at Strange Session without the final S. We are on Instagram where Krista does a magnifico job at the Strange Sessions. Uh, we're probably on the computer program Promise somewhere. <laughs> yep. And you can send us postcards and snail mail to the Strange Sessions, P.O. Box 434, Manitowoc, Wisconsin, 54221-0434. And you can call our, it's not so lonely anymore, our phone line at 920-443-9602. Yeah, it's gotten some action lately. It's gotten some action. More than I can say for me. (laughs) (laughs) So I think on that note, uh, from Krista and I in the Strange Cellar, we love you guys. Thank you for listening wherever you are in the world. And we are giving you a hug in our hearts. Mm -hmm. So until next time from the Strange Cellar, stay stay strange. strange.